to also get this thing uh, working. So uh, a few quick notes before we start. Uh, the power sources will be in the front, in this room, and in gallery. The seminar rooms are upstairs. Um, the, we want to thank our sponsors. So uh, we want to thank Oracle, MySQL, uh, the German U Unix Users Group, Goog, uh, Team Mix for doing our Wi-Fi, and uh, the password you will see on the doors uh, for the network here, which is OpenSUSE. Uh, we will be having lunch. There'll be a food truck coming between 12 and 2. So please find some time to go out and get some lunch that's sponsored, this, uh, sponsored today by my SQL. So <clears throat> uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first keynote speakers. And um, the first person I want to talk about is Thomas. Thomas is the uh, CTO of Salt, Salt Stack, and um, the technical co-founder of, of Salt. Um, and he is joined today by uh, David Boucher. And David uh, it likes to use Salt as a, as a tool to uh, yeah, bend technology, I guess, is what, is what he had said, and he's going to be jo joined by Joe Werner from SUSE, and they're going to bring us into the world of automation with SALT. So please welcome them to the stage. I'm really excited to be able to uh, uh, kind of kick off the uh, OpenSUSE conference. It's, it's been a lot of fun coming out here, and uh, it's also been a lot of fun to meet a lot of uh, new, or a lot of uh, SUSE people. So personally, um, I only recently switched over to SUSE. Uh, for a long time, I was a big Arch Linux fan and used a lot of Red Hat, but last year when uh, the SUSE team reached out to me and said that they were using SALT for uh, the new SUSE manager project. I thought to myself, maybe I need to look at SUSE again. And I hadn't looked at SUSE for many, many, many years. And I was very, very surprised at what I, what I found and learned about SUSE and was instantly convinced that uh, SUSE is hands down the way forward in Linux distributions. Very, very exciting stuff. Um, but what I'm here to talk to you today about is about um, next generation automation. So let me start by talking about just infrastructures and systems in general. One of the major problems that we're running into right now inside of infrastructure deployments and development is the increasing complexity and diversity of infrastructure environments. So we have more tools than ever, more models than, than ever for deploying and managing infrastructure, but we also have more things than ever, all the way up to uh, Internet of Things and uh, devices that are implanted all over the place. We've got all these new hyper-converged um, data center and hardware plays, as well as hybrid cloud, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we're seeing is something which we all should definitely have expected. And that is the dramatic increase in the complexity of our um, information systems. Now, as we increase the complexity and the, and the coverage of these information systems, the question arises and says, how do we deal with this new and more increasingly complex uh, environment? And this is where the model of automation that we use inside of SaltStack comes into play. And the model of automation that we use is one that is made to span all of these different areas, normalize the access that we have across a vast array of devices, and make, making it very, very easy to automate increasingly large and complex environments in a very, very smooth and manageable way. So. The first thing that I want to talk about, therefore, is complexity. 
When we are setting up these systems, we have seen, and especially over the last five, five to ten years, a dramatic, a dramatic increase in the complexity of the infrastructures that we are interfacing with. And so I think one of the questions that we have is where is the dramatic increase in complexity coming from? And I would say that it's coming from our increased availability of automation. As we have more automation that is available, it gives us more free time to make things more complex and more terrible, but at the same time get more stuff done. One thing that we see a lot of, and one of my favorite examples, um, is that we go into an organization and they say, well, before we introduced a, uh, a DevOps and uh, configuration management models, we were deploying five apps with a team of five people. And now we introduce these new automation models, we're deploying 50 apps with a team of five people. So if automation breeds more complexity and allows us to get more done and expose more functionality, then what, is, uh, what does that mean? Does it mean that we're moving towards a scenario where we, kind of, where we apex on the complexity that can be handled in an infrastructure? Or are we moving towards a scenario where we need to come up with new models of automation? Okay. The next thing that I want to talk about before diving into uh, models of automation has to do with what it means for an infrastructure to be large or complex, or for a problem set to be complex. Um, back at SaltConf a few months ago, I was asked, what does, it, what, what does large mean to you? And I explained that some of the largest infrastructures I've seen are only a few hundred servers because of the incredible level of complexity inside of the applications that are deployed. And then when we see very, very large deployments of tens of thousands and even millions of servers, oftentimes they have a fairly heterogeneous use, use case across those servers. And so I would say that something that is still small, can, physically, can still be large in its complexity. Now, how do we handle this? How do we handle increased complexity and larger environments? So it's not a bad thing that things are more complex. It's a bad thing if we cannot adequately manage those complex environments. So one of the things that I go around and, and say is that uh, I don't believe in revolution, I believe in evolution. I believe that when we develop new ideas, they are developed on top of older ideas and that they therefore grow. And that it's very difficult to bring in entirely fresh ideas and impose them on an existing uh, infrastructure or culture. Now, what does that mean then when it comes to infrastructure automation? If we look at the popular ideas around infrastructure automation that have emerged in the last few years, many of them stem back to two core ideas or concepts. One of which that I want to talk about first is something that was de described in some academic papers in 1993 by a man named Mark Burgess, a brilliant man and the man who created a piece of software called CF Engine. He defined basically the concept behind what we now call configure, modern configuration management. This is the idea of taking what a system is and abstracting what that system is in a declarative fashion so that you can declare what the system, what state the system should be in and then apply it again declaratively. Um, this is the aspect of SALT, for instance, in which we are the most well known for. But, as I developed SALT, we were certainly not the first ones to develop this concept. And so I realized that there are more vectors needed for automation. And the first thing that I did was look at other automation systems which exist and realize that we need not only to control the finite declarative state of systems, but we also need real-time access to those systems. The ability to reach out to those systems, change things on the fly, query those systems on the fly, and apply stateful changes on the fly. And so this is where I then go in and look at orchestration and remote execution models. 
orchestration and remote execution models come back and focus around a number of their own philosophies. The main focus I decided to use with SALT's remote execution was to just say, I need to make it as fast as possible. If it's as fast as possible and can reach all of my systems in microseconds, then things like building linear orchestration models is easy. Linear orchestration or runbook orchestration is again something you're probably all extremely familiar with, where you've got a task which runs in sequence. So some of the problems that we run into though with linear orchestration at scale is that it can take a long time to run. And those linear orchestration systems are generally also not item potent and declarative in the way in which they apply changes. They're very dependent upon step one, then step two, then step three, et cetera, which breaks that core model, which was described again by Mark Burgess originally around having a declarative system. And so we start to say, well, can we do better than this? Can we figure out a way that's better than our classical linear orchestration model? And so I thought, if everything is evolution, then maybe we need to evolve out of experience from areas that aren't just in IT automation. And so I thought back to my experience working uh, with the uh, US government and some time I had spent with uh, US Naval submarine automation. When we look at robotics automation, it functions very differently than what we're used to inside of IT. Much of the robotics automation that we see has to do with the definition of a finite rule set, which declares that if scenarios occur, then react to them in specific ways, and then applying that finite rule set onto the actual automation platform. And so there was a model inside of robotics that I became very fond of called flow programming, which allows us to do just that thing, say, based on the information that's coming back from our sensors and based on what um, information it is that we are aggregating from those sensors and from those events, what we are able to do is define when we're going to act, okay? And so I asked myself, could this model be used for systems automation, okay? And so once I brought these concepts together is where the definition of uh, SALT's automation platform really became cohesive. When we describe what SALT is as an automation platform, it's primarily four things. Um, we have the remote execution platform, which I talked about first. We've got the configuration automation system, which is again what people are most familiar with. The most, uh, the, the whole DevOps declare your infrastructure approach. Um, we have extensive cloud control, which I'm, I'm kind of glossing over in this talk. <laughs> um, and then we've got the event driven orchestration. Now, the event driven orchestration is something which is a lot more unique to how SALT handles um, orchestration and automation. And so let me start by actually describing for those of you who are, who are not as familiar with SALT, um, some of the basics with respect to how it works. So SALT can operate, as, uh, as you can see, in an agentless or agentful way. We install an agent, which we call a minion, out on all of the systems that we want to manage. If we have a system that we cannot install an agent on, then we use one of the agentless pipelines, which is either the proxy minion or SALT SSH. Um, and by cannot or don't want to, it doesn't matter. We're, we're cool anyway, anyway about it. And then that agent is where all of the intelligence sits. One of the problems that we run into with uh, dealing with distributed automation is that we have to consider the fact that we need to have distributed intelligence and distributed work happening. Um, some of the problems we run into with a lot of automation platforms is that they still centralize the majority of the work, which also causes scaling issues. But if we distribute the work, the logic, and the intelligence 
out to the machines which are actually being automated, then that can, again, substantially improve our ability to scale. And so all of the information, all of the intelligence about how to do the automation work exists in these minions. The minions are then continuously connected back up to a salt master or a master cluster. And then that master, the work it does, is limited to the coordination of those minions, which again assists us in scaling out to a very large scale. And why we have deployments of salt, which uh, are as small as five to ten systems, but as large as our largest installation right now is actually getting close to uh, one million uh, salt minions. Now, when we, so when we look at how this works, the next challenge that we run into is network topology. Again, a lot of automation systems mandate that you either need to have bi-directional communication over the network to be able to uh, manage the end nodes, or that your central point reaches out to the nodes that you're trying to manage. SALT's approach is to make sure that we have the maximum level of topological flexibility. And so the way that we do this is that the controlling master doesn't need to be aware of where any of its minions are. They just need to be aware of the master. And it doesn't need to be able to route to the minions. The minion only needs to be able to route to the master. And again, this substantially simplifies um, the topological constraints. Okay. So, when, so if I start there at the bottom with remote execution, and, and I'll demonstrate, we'll demonstrate all these things in just a few minutes. When I start at the bottom with remote execution, what we're looking at is that the salt master is able to send in parallel to all of these continual TCP connections, which are connected concurrently to the master, is able to send in parallel a tiny packet which tells the minion what to do. Since the minion has all the intelligence in and of itself, we can dramatically minimize the amount of information which needs to be sent over the wire. And this is also very important when it comes to dealing with scale, okay? And then those minions can execute based on the remote execution pattern which they receive. Next, when it comes to configuration, uh, configuration automation, we're able to declaratively define on the master end exactly what needs to happen to those minions or the declared state in which they need to be. And then we can use the remote execution bus to tell them when to apply those states, which again allows us to have an instant connection and an instant modification of those systems. Okay. And then the hallmark here and kind of the point of the, the talk I'm trying to give is around the event-driven automation systems. So like I was saying with uh, robotics controls, there is a model around making an event-driven automation system. And that model is that we need to be able to get events or alerts from all of our controlling systems. So how do we do that? But we also, but not only do we need to get those events, those events need to be processed. And once those events are processed, the system processing it needs to be able to enact real change and real management on those subsequent systems. And so this is where the concept of event-driven automation comes into play. So that means that we need to act whenever a system is ready. The defined rule set that we're dealing with needs to be capable of being declarative, okay? And we need to converge on these concepts of monitoring and management. And so on all of the minions that we have inside of SALT, there's a system called beacons and the SALT event bus. Everything that SALT does gets converted into an event. And the beacon system inside of SALT allows us to absorb events from anything that is happening on that system and maintains itself being extremely open-ended. So instead of saying I'm generating events for a very specific automation purpose, we're able to say I'm generating events for whatever I want to generate events for, okay? All right, 
And so then, if we look at this event-driven automation, it needs a number of building blocks. And those building blocks are very much so those cornerstone components of what SALT is. So we need open-ended remote execution so that we've got the ability to control the remote systems that we need to react to and manipulate. We need the item potent or convergence routines that exist inside of configuration management so that reapplication of certain routines doesn't uh, modify the system in, in uh, bad ways. Event generation is important. I just mentioned that with respect to SALT's beacon system, but also deep integration. We need to be able to talk to virtually any type of system that's out there. Um, one of the demonstrations uh, that was done last year at SUSECON was using SALT to integrate with and control light bulbs. And, uh, and the demonstration we're going to do today um, has SALT integrating with uh, uh, text messaging uh, using the Twilio, Twilio APIs, okay? And so that deep integration is important because the automation systems need to read from and manipulate diverse sets of systems and converge on decisions between diverse sets of systems. So that what is happening with respect to um, a thermal gauge can be used to define potentially how server equipment is operating. And likewise with storage and networking and converging those concepts together. All right, so the way in which this is accomplished is through a concept called, whoop, through a concept called a reactor. And so we have all of these events that are being generated and they are then ingested back into this reactor system that exists on the SALT master, okay? Now, in SALT, we have defined two types of reactors. Uh, there is the single event reactor. The idea here is that it waits for a very specific event to come in and then it reacts to that specific event. The benefits here is that it's, very, it's a very simple reactor. It's very high performance. Um, it's very easy to understand, very easy to learn. Now, then, then it makes a lot of the simple use cases of event-driven automation also very, very simple. Now, the other type of reactor which we define is an aggregate event reactor. Now, an aggregate event rea reactor is more complicated and a little more complicated to understand, but allows you to define substantially more complex rule sets. So inside of SALT, these are expressed through these two reactors. The original SALT reactor, which we introduced in 2013, um, and is extremely hardened, used the world round, um, is used to manage uh, reactions and events spanning, again, tens of thousands of servers. Um, so very, very hardened. And then a brand new reactor, which is the aggregate reactor, I spent a little over a year and a half doing research trying to figure out how to build this, um, that we very recently introduced, albeit it's still experimental, called the thorium reactor. And this exposes this flow programming paradigm to event-driven re reactions. Um, even in the demo that we're doing today, we're still gonna be using the, uh, the single event reactor just because thorium is so incredibly new. Uh, but the benefits or the things that we're excited about with thorium have to do with the fact that it is made to be able to aggregate large numbers of events and make extremely intelligent decisions about uh, what to react to. Um, some of the other things that's really interesting about thorium is that it's a event reactor system which is actually built on SALT's configuration management engine. So it accomplishes the item potent and um, linear scheduling tasks that it does because it takes advantage of the existing SALT configuration management engine, which is in and of itself extremely uh, hardened and widely used. Okay. And so then this brings together this idea or this model of event-driven automation. With event-driven automation, we don't have to wait for linear orchestration to pan out across large sets of servers. Uh, we don't have to 
uh, stop linear orchestrations over and over again because we can have item potent routines happening inside of those events. And it also allows us again to converge on a vast array of individual components so that again, we can take information from anything or any type of system which could be communicated with and then converge that information into a single decision-making matrix so that all of those integrations come together. All right. So I'm going to mention a couple of use cases, then I'm going to ask, uh, and ask Dave Boucher to come up, and he's going to give us a demonstration. Um, but a couple of the use cases that we've got here is some of our larger installations is uh, LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn has been using the event-driven automation platform system for quite a few years now to automate code rollouts, to automate continuous integration and continuous uh, deployment integrations. Um, and LinkedIn has also been used at, using it uh, for the filtering and management of incoming uh, data so that all of the information that's happening in their, in their data center is filtered using the reactor system. And then uh, Intuit, which is... Actually, I'm in, Intuit's a very American company. <laughs> uh, they do they do American tax processing, so you pro so you probably haven't heard of them. <laughs> uh, but so they're they're a very very large organization in the U.S. And similarly, they are using event driven automation to deploy multiple stage automation, um, as well as uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment. And we've got hundreds and arguably thousands of infrastructures making heavy use of the salt reactor uh, today. Let's see. And so again, this is, a, this is a model which diverges from the traditional models of orchestration and automation. It's a model that allows us to be substantially more scalable, allows us to function in a faster way, and allows us to have a level of convergence and a distributed logic, which otherwise we can't really attain um, using a lot of the traditional methodologies. Okay, so uh, Dave is going to give us a fantastic demonstration, which I promise uh, uh, works. <laughs> so, here you go, Dave. Okay, um, really excited to be here. So th this is the, where the rubber hits the road. Uh, we're gonna do some live, this is not a canned demo. I tested it this morning in my hotel room, it worked great, got here, it was broken. Uh, and I realized, you know, it was our, our networking issue, so now we're good now, supposedly. So, um, so when I first found out about Salt, uh, I was at a Python user group in Utah and I met Tom, and he was talking about this new project he was building out uh, to manage infrastructure, and um, it sounded really exciting. And uh, so I got involved um, helping port uh, the Salt Minion to Windows, um, fixing bugs. I was like, in the original IRC channel, I think I was like the third person to join or something like that. So um, I've seen Salt kind of go from the very early, early stages to where it is now. Um, and one of the things that got me most excited about Salt was the immediacy of uh, interacting with your servers. Now, instead of running a report and getting a report a few minutes later or manually logging into a bunch of servers and checking disk space and all that stuff, I could do that from one machine, get all that data, and then do what I want with that. So right here we have a, a Salt Master with several minions. Um, so we're going to run a, a little command here that will tell us, okay, so I have, I have four minion, minions here. Um, I have a CentOS 6, a uh, SUSE 13.2, and uh, a trusty, uh, Ubuntu trusty server. And um, what I just ran there was uh, called an execution module. So there's, a, it, there's actually a test.py, familiar with Python. Um, and there's a ping function in there that just returns true. Um, Salt 
ships with a whole uh, huge library of these execution modules that do everything from manage file systems, managing your databases, uh, installing and configuring software, managing uh, your Ruby installation to, I mean, just, you know, sky's the limit. Docker, uh, LXC, just, you know, just all kinds of things that, uh, that you can use. Um, this test module has several things we can do. Like I can see what version of salt they're all running. So you can see here. How's the size? Is that, can everybody see that okay? Okay. Um, so you can see, you know, all the versions of salt they're running. One thing that's fantastic is we have a concept of an outputter, so we can change um, our view. So here we have a kind of a human readable view, but if I want to get that in JSON so I can use that in some other, some other application, I can say, hey, I want this in JSON, then I can pipe that to another application or to a file to be used elsewhere. It's really handy. Um, so we have some other functions, like uh, we have a package module where we can do, for example, list packages. So there's every piece of software on all four of those servers and the version that they have. So if you need to make sure you have a certain version of software, I can check what that is right now. I don't have to check a database or a spreadsheet or assume we should have a certain version. I can check and see what's out there right this moment. Um, there's a disk usage here. Um, there's all of the, the status of all the file systems on all my servers, so I can check what their current status is right at this moment. Um, there's a whole you know, ton of things. Now, if you notice, we have three different operating systems we're running as, that run that command as. So disk.usage is cross-platform. That'll work on Windows, um, OS X, uh, all the Linuxes you can imagine, uh, even some of the older uh, Unices and things like that. So um, it's really powerful in that way. It's very cross-platform, including things like installing packages. So. Um, So here I'm going to see what ROSs are. So we have two Ubuntu servers, OpenSUSE, and uh, CentOS. Um, so I can do a, for example, okay. So if I have, um, I can install Apache 2 on uh, my Ubuntu server. Um, this will come back and tell me exactly what packages were installed. And uh, there we go. So now Apache is installed on that server. And if we use the network module, I can get the IP address of that server. And there's the default Apache uh, web page there. So again, this is all live. Um, we are doing things uh, really, you know, quickly, and I can remove that as well. Okay, so that's an execution module. Now, we may not want to do everything like this um, live on a command line. Uh, you know, humans are, you know, obviously notorious for, uh, so now you see the Apache is no longer serving there. So we have a thing, a thing called assault state that allows us to statefully determine what should be installed or how we're going to manage our servers. So if we go to uh, our default location for our assault states, um, I'm going to create a new assault state that will install Apache. So we're going to put our package name. I got installed. Now this is a stateful uh, way of managing it. So let's say I had the wrong package name. Oh, let's see. Uh, so let's Ok, 
Okay, so now I'm going to run this uh, Apache simple, and it's going to come back with an error saying that unable to locate the package Apache 2.3. So I'm going to come in here, remove this, and I'm going to run this in test mode. So it's going to go out and say, okay, um, the following packages would have been installed. Apache 2 would have uh, been installed for us. So let's go ahead and run that. Okay, so that worked. So again, it's a really simple, you know, Apache 2 is installed. Uh, you can complicate things a little bit. So for example, in the, the example I have here, um, we're going to manage the package and the, the things in the, uh, uh, we have two variables there. We're gonna get the, uh, pa the package name. So this makes this state cross-platform so we can actually uh, tell us that you know, if we're on Ubuntu, we're going to use Apache 2. If we're on a Red Hat based system, we're going to use uh, HTTPD. And you can determine, um, you can specify for each OS what the package name should be. We're also going to manage the Apache service as well with this state. So again, this is stateful. If the state is already there, or if the package is already there, um, salt will not do anything. So if I run that state again, uh, salt checked, and it said, oh, the package has already been installed, we're not going to do anything at this point. Um, so that way, you know you're not going to modify anything unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, okay, so again, this is, this is an example of an execution module. The, the, the text file that we just saw was an um, example of a salt state. And this is kind of the typical way you would um, manage your servers with a master with your minions. We could also do this over SSH, um, and also we, you could also do this without a master at all. Everything can happen locally just on, on a minion. Um, all right, so now that we have this really fast control over all of our servers, um, there's some really interesting things we can do with that. So, you know, again here you can see that this, running this command, you know, took less than a second on, on four servers. Um, on 5,000 servers, it would take a few seconds, and mostly that's displaying um, all of the return data on your screen in your terminal. Um, and so we have this really fast um, communication between our servers and, and, our, and, our, and our minions, so you can do things with that connection. So Tom mentioned beacons. So beacons is a little process that runs on your minion on a server that uh, watches something. So we have beacons that'll watch, um, they'll use iNotify to watch a file or a directory for changes or additions of files. We have a service beacon that'll watch daemons that are running. Um, we have daemons that'll watch SSH logins. Uh, there's a whole variety of them. You can watch uh, uh, output of, of PS, a uh, whole variety of things. Um, and when that beacon notices a change of some type, then it'll send an event on Salt's event bus. So between the minions and the master, there's an event bus where events get sent up to the master. And um, it's kind of dumb in that it doesn't, you know, has really, doesn't have a lot of intelligence. It just sees whatever is, it watches whatever you're telling it to watch and then sends an event. Um, then on the master or on the minion, uh, you can have a thing called a reactor that will watch that event bus, and when it sees a specific event that you care about, it will do something. And that something could be anything that Salt can do. So if, see, if you see an event that your, um, maybe your uh, CPU usage passes a certain threshold, then maybe that means we need to spin up another VM or two and add that to the load balancer. Or maybe we need to restart some services, or maybe send a notification to some notification service. It could be, you know, really anything, sky's the limit, anything Salt can do. Um, Salt has a REST API as well that allows you to um, set up authentication for a user to uh, send REST commands to either execute Salt commands or pull data from that. 
Um, as part of that, there is a, you can, you can actually stream that event, the event stream that's coming through and, um, and do something with that. So the demo I have today, we're going to um, show two different beacons. One beacon is a, the iNotify beacon, so we're going to watch a directory and a file. And also, we're going to use the Twilio text message beacon to uh, watch a, um, an event bus, um, a message queue on Twilio. So um, let's look, look what that configuration looks like. OK, so here's our beacons uh, section. We have an iNotify beacon. We're going to look for all um, messages or changes to this uh, slash serve slash blah.txt. Then we're going to look for, uh, we're going to mask off these close right uh, items for the uh, directory of slash serve slash testing. Um, and we're going to do, that, do this recursively. Uh, we're also going to set up our Twilio um, account information. So we need our account SID and our and, uh, authentication token here, and then our number, and then the interval that we're going to pull for that queue. <clears throat> if I... Um, okay, so now in this top terminal, we're going to watch the event bus. And down here, if I... So you can see the, the event bus received an event saying there was a file that had a change of enclosed right, and here's the path to that. Uh, text file. Okay, so here is a web page that's actually being, um, it's a one, it's a single page JavaScript application that Salt, the Salt uh, API is actually hosting for me uh, locally. And what it's doing is, in the background, it's listening uh, to that, um, that event bus. And whenever it sees it's going to filter through whenever it sees a, um, an event that matches uh, some criteria that I've set, then it is going to output information about that event to our web page here. So you can see when I modify these text fields, we're just getting these events, and then we're displaying these on this application. So, um, so that's the, uh, again, the uh, I notify. I'm just gonna see those there. Um, now for the Twilio one, we have a phone number here, and if you can keep it G-rated, please. I guess the G-rated is probably a US thing, so keep it uh, suitable for children, please. Um, you can send a text to this phone number here in the U.S. And every five seconds, um, that beacon is checking that text message queue and then sending an event on the event bus. And then the Salt API is uh, watching that event bus and outputting the things there. This will also do um, MMS picture messaging as well. Let's see if this is able to go through. Thank you. Somebody has sent that. <laughs> so this is kind of a ridiculous uh, uh, thing. You will probably you wouldn't do this exact thing in production, but I put this demo together because to me it, it, it kind of shows you that you can build what you need with Salt. Salt gives you a whole bunch of 
uh, tools that you can put together to build exactly what you need. Uh, Salt tries very hard not to force you to modify your infrastructure to uh, work just like um, Salt needs you. Salt tries to uh, do things in the way that you need them to happen. Because everybody has their own, their own unique infrastructures and uh, this allows you to build you know, exactly what you need, like I said. So um, again, this is a combination of uh, beacons, uh, Salt's event bus, and um, also Salt's uh, REST, API, REST API here. Um, Please don't send any JavaScript. I'm not sure if this is all sanitized really well, so. <laughs> that could be bad. Um, so I sent the picture text, but apparently it's taking a while to, uh, to go through, but. Susa paid us extra to have these little advertisements they're sending up here, so. Okay. Um, so you can see here in this uh, output here, you can see this is the, uh, all the events coming through. Again, this is all just data that's coming across this event bus, and you can do whatever you want with this. So um, using these beacons, um, we've... Uh, <laughs> uh, people have done some really interesting things. So we had somebody had this application they'd purchased from some private vendor, and... Uh, <laughs> There's no database involved with this. <laughs> um, but they had this application that would just chew up RAM. And over the course of a week, roughly once a week, they had to go actually go and like restart this cluster of services. Uh, and and they, the, the vendor knew about the problem, and it was just going to be months before it was fixed. So they were able to set up a beacon that would watch the RAM usage of this service. And once it reached, a certain threshold, um, the beacon would send an event up to Salt Master saying, hey, you know, we've, we've passed this threshold. And then the Salt Master knew, okay, when this happens, first we're going to send a notification to our logging server and to our notification server so people, so humans know about this. And then we're gonna go through this cluster of servers and one by one restart this specific service to get rid of this, this uh, uh, the service there. So um, anyway, these are some very powerful tools um, that Salt will allow you to make your infrastructure just sing and, and work um, uh, really well. So uh, I think uh, now we're going to pass on the uh, time to Tom and Joe. Okay, yeah, now we'll pass the torch over to uh, somebody that many of you already know and love, and that's uh, Joe Werner. Thanks. Yeah. Good morning also on my part. Um, we've got a pretty good uh, preparation now for arguments why to use salt. Um, actually, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, so the SUSE manager team, uh, so the team behind our SUSE systems management solution, um, had that same problem. So we were trying to figure out what is the right tool for our purposes because we ran into all the problems that uh, Thomas mentioned. You know, linear execution takes a lot of time. Lots of systems have to be reached and um, our existing um, stack that is um, kind of 15 years old based on the Spacewalk project um, does a lot of those things in sequence and it may take some time. It's not really instantaneous, so it's more of a batch processing. You reach out to the system, the system may come back an hour later or whenever it wants because it would just wake up every couple of minutes, hours, days, whatever. Yeah, so we were looking for something um, more um, instantaneous, better scale, and so on. That's when we decided to look into lots of different systems, and the decision was made to go with SALT for the reasons that, that uh, Thomas has mentioned. Um, 
If you're not familiar with SUSE Manager because it's not uh, maybe what um, you're using as an OpenSUSE user, just very briefly, we are trying to basically cover the whole life cycle um, of running operating systems and applications in data centers. I'm calling this the SUSE Manager magic wheel, so the inner part of that wheel, the inner circle around the, the hub of SUSE Manager is about all the processes from um, asset management um, to provisioning, patching software, configuration management, of course, and so on. And the outer circle is, is kind of the control and um, monitoring circle. And as you've heard again, SALT can do both. So SALT can help with all those um, tasks, executing stuff on machines, keeping state, but it can also help a lot with keeping track of what's going on, monitoring things in real time, and then uh, combining those two things, basically acting on those events. Yeah, um, I like this one, I, I had to bring it up. That's how marketing kind of sums up what Susan Manager can do, um, tame your IT, yeah. Um, someone mentioned that, yeah, you shouldn't probably use those thingies after the, the hedgehog has used them. But yeah. Um, so with SUSE Manager 3, the SUSE Manager server basically becomes a SALT master. So all the communication um, to the managed systems is using that SALT message bus that we saw uh, on Tom's slides. And uh, we also, of course, leverage the, the event mechanism to collect data back from those systems. Um, this helped us solve quite a few of challenges. Uh, quite a few challenges. First of all, better scale. Um, that one I, I always try to pronounce: parallelize, parallelize. <laughs> Terrible word for me. Um, we wanted to be able to do things in parallel, um, at least for hundreds of systems, so we don't have batches of one, but can reach out to 500 at a time and so on, um, in a very short window of time. We have customers. Um, running in the thousands of systems behind SUSE Manager and they have patch windows of maybe four hours per month or per quarter and everything has to be done within those four hours. So that, that was one of the challenges. Um, and then be expressive. Um, again, going from this approach where you basically write scripts in a more modern way to an approach where you declare how a system should look like. So go from install this user to this user should be installed, always check whether it's still there, if not, bring it back. Uh, one of the first things we did was to bridge the gap between, between SUSE Manager's uh, core engine that's mainly written in Java, uh, which was not our choice, but, but we ended up um, with that legacy, and it's not that bad actually, um, to the Python-based um, salt uh, stack. Um, so one of the first contributions we did, Johannes Renner was the main uh, engineer behind that, was contribute uh, an API connector to the SALT um, API for Java. Um, this allows us to have a very loose coupling between SUSE Manager and SALT. So in the, in the unlikely event that we don't like it anymore, we could just write a new one for something else and, and rip and replace it. Of course, that's not... Um, going to happen anytime soon. Um, now, I want to guide you through a few simple steps. Um, this is very similar to the demo that we did at um, the SALT-Conf um, earlier this year, where you can go from a generic, just enough operating system image um, that you register to SUSE Manager, um, assign it to server groups, and then apply the state. So the, the, the overall system state, um, that's what salt stack uh, calls a high state. So you can apply individual rules, but if you want to basically get everything applied that should be applied on that machine, that's the high state. Yeah. First of all, because the connection has to be secured, there's some key exchange involved. Um, and in SUSE Manager, it, it basically looks like this. So there is a command line tool, of course, for SALT. Um, a minion that comes up sends a key to the master, and then the master um, can either accept that key, you can even put it 
like auto accept all the keys if you know your infrastructure, you know, let's say you have a large um, high performance computing environment, it's completely closed, the network, uh, you own the network, you can just automate this. But if you want to have control, um, you can check the fingerprint um, in the UI or on the command line and then you can um, apply, um, you know, assign those machines, accept those keys uh, that are still pending. And then this will actually, again, use the event mechanism in the back because once the machine has accepted its key, it will send an event and say, well, I'm here now. And now SUSE manager will read that on the net, uh, on the on the API bus and trigger the next step, which is okay. Now get all the hardware data, all the software data of that machine and, and put it into the SUSE manager inventory. Now the second step is um, you want to assign state to those machines. And actually more or less by accident we came up with a very powerful pattern here that combines the best of the legacy uh, concepts we already had in the SUSE manager and the Spacewalk project um, with SALT's state concept. And I'm calling that for a lack of better name, the groups and states pattern. So uh, this is how it works. In SUSE Manager, you can create random groups. Those, those groups are actually more like tags, so it's not like hierarchical groups, and a machine can only be in one group, but you can basically have a group for your web servers, a group for your servers um, that are in a certain rack, or in a certain location, or that are managed by Joe or Tom, um, uh, man machines that are Red Hat systems or SUSE systems, um, and then you can basically um, choose an you know, an, a union or intersection, let's say all the SUSE servers managed by Joe that are web servers and running in Nuremberg. Um, so these groups, um, that's where we assign states to. So let's say we want a state that, that does all the stuff that you always have to do in all the web servers in the company. Yeah. So we create that state, just like that little snippet that, that David showed us. Um, to install the Apache server, configure the Apache server, and we don't assign it to a machine, we assign it to that group. And now, we can assign systems to that group, and basically by adding those systems to the group, all we have to do is run the high state command, so basically apply the state, um, and for all the machines in these groups, they will become web servers, and they will stay web servers as long as we um, keep running the high state from time to time. Uh, and that's very powerful because it completely decouples two problems. Uh, a user who has no clue about how salt states work can still go into the SUSE manager uh, UI or use the SUSE manager API and add a new machine to that group and it, it will just work. Now, what also helps with that is that we've created three layers in both the configuration side so where can you define your salt states, your salt configuration, and um, on the SUSE manager uh, group side and so on. So in the salt configuration, first of all, we have configuration that will always come with a SUSE manager. It's taken for granted. So we have a few like um, keys that we have to roll out on the machine so that Zuper knows about which RPMs um, it, it should be using and so on, the signing keys. Um, you can't change them. You can, but you would change them in a place that is read-only on the file system for use. And then we have auto-generated stuff from SUSE Manager. For example, if you join such a group, we will use um, SALT's pillar mechanism, um, which is a secure way of distributing um, data to your machines uh, and just inject data from SUSE Manager into those pillars. Um, this is also auto-generated um, states, for example, when we actually um, add a new package or remove a package, uh, what we're doing is we create a salt state for that. And then finally, there's user-generated content, and that means that anything you can do with a plain salt master um, in your own setups, you can just basically copy over to your SUSE manager, there's your playground, you can add stuff, and um, these three layers allow us to integrate with existing solutions, but at the same time have a lot of control um, about things that always have to happen because they are SUSE defaults and things that you do from SUSE manager. And finally, on, 
on the SUSE manager side, we can apply states to organizations. That means anybody in the whole organization has to do that. Let's say you have a policy that um, certain users should never be on those machines. Yeah, or a policy that the firewall always has to be on. You can do that for the whole organization and it will always be applied. And then you've seen the groups. So you can apply state to groups. And this basically doesn't mean that there's a third, uh, that's a second layer, but that's, that's a whole um, world of layers because those groups can overlap. So you can have five or six groups assigned to the same machine. Yeah, one caveat, we haven't figured out yet um, what happens if they are called in different orders. So that's where you have to be careful. Those, those states would have to be written in a way that they can coexist or that you know, ordering doesn't matter. Um, but we're working on that part. And finally, you can even override settings on an individual system. So if you have 100 web servers and there's this one web server that needs to have a different setup. Yeah, maybe it's not running Apache, but it's running Nginx or whatever. Um, um, then you can do that um, just as an overlay. And uh, what, what, a, uh, what, what, what this um, helps um, with is if you have a setup like a medium-sized um, web server setup where you have a load balancer, you have a web server and a media server separately, um, you can just um, grow that by creating twins. Yeah, basically, you add a new web server to that group, you add a new media server um, to the other group, um, and, and just run the states, and, and you scale out. Um, another thing, of course, that you can also do because of the reactor mechanism, um, in, and we also did that in the demo um, in, in Salt Lake City, is that you can make the load balancer aware of those changes, because the load balancer has to know, oh, there's a new backend available, um, that I can point clients to a um, new web server backend or a new uh, media server backend. So you can rewrite the load balancer configuration just based on those incoming um, events. Um, when a machine comes up, it's configured, it will send standard events, but you can also, in your states, fire individual events like inform load balancer and, and even pass random information, bit of information that you want, like uh, keywords or so, um, and that way the load balancer can automatically be updated without any other out-of-band technology, without any need for um, using, uh, let's say, um, pacemaker or, or, or other HA mechanisms. Yeah, so there are a few more things that we put into SUSE Manager um, with regard to the SALT integration. There's more to come. I'm just running you through uh, two or three of those things. First of all, um, the command line stuff that David showed us, um, much of that can also be done uh, from the web UI. So you can use you know, the, this um, uh, syntax using uh, placeholders, asterisks, and so on um, to scope only the media service. Like this would would um, trigger all the services that start um, with media um, and do simple commands. Um, in this case, you'd also get the input, uh, the output nicely formatted in the web UI for all those machines. Uh, we haven't tried out what happens if you do that to 10,000 servers yet in the UI, but it will uh, work really nicely for a um, couple of dozen. Uh, for now, this is limited to one particular part of the SOL API where you call um, bash commands. Um, so this is for running, just basically executing bash commands. We are going to expand that um, and also make use of um, the fact that Python allows for introspection, so we can basically, um, while you type, expose all the options that you have for um, filling out stuff and so on. And um, another thing that we did, um, using the existing state mechanisms, we basically created a, a simple UI for uh, configuring your packages. This was basically because we had that feature already, we wanted to port it over to the salt-based mechanisms. Um, in the back, this will just create a state file that says Emacs um, absent, I think, or yeah, it's, I think it's dot absent and vim dot present. 
or installed. Yeah, I'm always mixing that up. Um, yeah, this is, of course, that's the standard setup for all the, all the SUSE servers. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so you can do very simple things with packages, like always make sure that Emacs is removed and always make sure that Vim is installed with the latest version or with a random version. So there are two um, possibilities there. Yeah, we will dive into more of those things in the sessions during, during the day. Um, my session is going to focus mostly on how you can hack salt, how you can extend it, um, like the things that uh, Tom mentioned around managing like pipes. I think we will see um, stuff that, that's being done in the um, storage team as well, um, um, SUSE Enterprise storage team, and a few other examples around open uh, stack and, and VMware as well. Um, those talks are all uh, happening in the gallery, a room, I think it's over there, and um, yeah, and I hope you, you'll enjoy the day and, and you'll better understand why we are going um, with SALT. Um, one final remark to the OpenSUSE guys, um, SALT is just a super in a way on OpenSUSE. So we have the, not, not, not the 2016 packages yet, we are in the process of updating to the 2016 packages, but the 2015 8.8, .8, I think, packages are um, available on OpenSUSE, both Leap and um, Tumbleweed, but just super in. And in my presentation, I also have a slide um, to show you where you always get our latest development packages um, that we are using for SUSE Manager um, upstream development as well. Yeah, thank you. And I think now um, I'll ask Doug again to the stage for some logistics. And of course, question and answers, Tom, David, or myself. Where are we time test, wise? Test. Yep, cool. Any Three. questions? Uh, we have a. There's a lot of people out there who don't come from a big systems background. Um, they may have maybe three or four servers. Uh, what? How small can your systems that you run um, be, and you still get enough benefit to make it worthwhile investing in a tool such as Salt? So really, that depends on what you're doing with those systems. Um, so we, we definitely see scenarios where people see a lot of benefit and they are using less than five systems. Um, uh, but usually that's along the lines of where they need to, they need to coordinate things that happen on a regular basis or those five systems that they have are fairly transient so they need to be set up again on a regular basis. Um, honestly, if you've got three servers that you're going to statically set up, uh, then, yeah, you, you aren't necessarily going to see a lot of that value yet. Um, but uh, it is something that uh, even at that scale, if you, have a, if you plan on getting bigger, it's good to be able to define your systems in a declarative way so that what you have done becomes natively documented and it's something that's easy for you to transfer forward. So, yeah, I mean, it's easy to say, hey, I've got 20 plus systems, salt's going to be a benefit. Uh, but yeah, it, it does get kind of kind of tricky when you're down to really, really small numbers. So sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Coming from big systems background, I usually say five. Once you've got five <laughs> machines, it's really worth it. That's my personal <laughs> opinion. <laughs> Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, let me just add to that. So Richard Brown um, uh, wrote a really, really nice blog post a while ago on his kind of private setup that where he's using salt. I mean, sometimes it's really what, what Tom says about documentation, about uh, being able to just rebuild this. If you, let's say you go to a different provider and it's really just one or two machines. Uh, if you know it's all in my states, you can just roll it out somewhere else. You can replicate it. You can also test it very well. We are also using it in, in um, setting up the open QA infrastructure. Um, it's not hundreds of nodes, but it makes sure that you, when you bring up the system, it's all documented in code. And that's one of the DevOps paradigms, even if it's a, a small number of machines. Yeah. 
Yeah, and again, I mean, it's about complexity. If, if the complexity is, okay, I have to add a new user or I have to change the password, then don't bother. But if it's about a whole bunch of things that you always have to do when you bring up that system or when you upgrade it, then give it a try. More questions? This one. I have seen that the, 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 the client uses root privileges. Is it required? The salt minion uh, can run um, without root privileges, but then of course it's very limited in what it can do. Um, that's a kind of generic problem in, in Linux or in all the Unixes that are not um, like there's an AIX that does it differently. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, the default setup for the minion, like, like Joe was saying, is to run as root because then it can, you know, do what it needs to do. Um, Salt does ship with a system called a pseudo executor. So we added this in the 2015.8 release. Um, what the pseudo executor does allow you to do is run the minion as non-root, and then all of the execution commands which, which run on the minion are processed by sudo. And so then you can use sudo as your privilege gate, which means that it makes it a lot easier to be able to specify that some commands need sudo, some commands don't need sudo, and then the minion ha receives a localized, narrow privilege set based specifically on what you want it to do. Does that answer your question? No. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yeah, and of course, con conceptually, we could do anything that we did with, let's say, DBus and Package Kit. Um, it's not a limitation of Salt. It's just if you run a Salt module and it has to be to do things that only root can do, you have to find a way of making sure that it can. Yeah. So I, th I could imagine in a in a in a um, future release that we would implement something similar to Package Kit, where you expose certain features to a user use, uh, using Dbus, for example, and then trigger it from salt, yeah. Just in most cases, um, when you talk automation, you have to lock down that part of your infrastructure anyway, because even if you're limiting users to only doing certain things, just be aware that there's always a chain. Like, if you can install a package, you can do anything, as long as the package is installed using RPM, and then RPM is running as root and so on. It's, it's very um, easy to um, be in a kind of false sense of security where you think you are secure. But actually, of course, as user manager, server, or salt master, if you root on that machine, you rule your data center, anything. Yeah? Um, that's, that's part of the automation paradigm because you want to be able to change anything, to know about anything that's going on. That's why you have to secure the, uh, uh, the infrastructure. That's why we are using uh, strong encryption for all the transports. And yeah, you don't, you shouldn't be sloppy with securing that SUSE manager server or that salt master. Yeah, Joe, Joe said that fantastically. And I really like the fact that he brought up that you need to be careful with security, that you aren't applying layers of security that make you feel good, but don't actually help in the end. <laughs> we see that that's a very, very common thing that we run into, is that people don't understand that, like Joe was saying, if you're allowing somebody to run an install an RPM, or you're allowing somebody to shell out, or even, even if you feel like you're restricting other things, you've still, you're allowing somebody access to a system which is running that logically itself doesn't have security gates. So, yeah, just be aware of the entire chain all the way down. Uh, any other questions? Nope, doesn't look like it. Okay, um, thank you very much, gentlemen, for your keynote and... Uh, Please run a quick So the, the salt sack summit is gonna take place in gallery, that's the other room next to the bathrooms here. And then the Sousa Lab Summit will start in here uh, in about 15 minutes. Um, also I wanna thank our sponsors, uh, Coca-Cola and Monster, so you can get those free in the back at the bar. Um, please do enjoy the beer garden at some point. There is Wi-Fi access out there. 
and the food truck is here, but it will start, it'll open at uh, noon. Thank you.